most righteous, loving, heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you now in all, thanking you for all the greatness that you have, that you are, all the things that are made through you, by you, for you, thanking you for being part of your creation, thanking you for our very existence, thanking you for friends and family, thanking you for fellowship, thanking you for your word, thanking you for your son, thanking you that we can walk hand in hand with Jesus, thanking you that we have a home for our soul, as we know this world is not our home. We thank you for all the blessings that we have, the spiritual blessings in Christ and heavenly places, and the blessings that we have here on this earth. We thank you that we can come together now and, and have an hour of study, to study your word, to learn something, and put it in our lives. We pray, Father God, that you help us take it in, plan it, make it a part of us, and use it in the world. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're in the middle school class. Go with the front of the class. Middle schoolers, you're going to be on the new class all the way down on the right. stands or falls and either everything we believe in stands or falls based on the integrity of the scripture. And that's where we're, we're going to start. The Bible, it is God's breath by human, to, through human spirit recorded by human hand. And that is my basic understanding and definition of inspiration. But when we come to the Bible, and for those of you, I want to encourage you a memory verse. Brother, I can't memorize Bible. Well, if you say that, you're right. You never will. But if you say, you know, I can memorize it, this is an important one. Do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to fulfill it. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. This was Jesus' own statement of his belief in the integrity of God's word. And so that's why it's our memory verse that kicks this off is the general integrity that we expect to find. When you come to the Bible, the English word comes in its very simple history. All right? As you can see, in Greek, hey, biblos. Latin, biblia. French, bible. Right? Greek, hagiographe. Right? Say that. Holy writing. Holy writing. Okay? As you, but you can see on three of those, what? Latin, French, you know, in German, Das Buch or Der Bible. Uh, and it just means book. That's what it means. There is no other book in the history of the world that means the book except the Bible. When people say, you know the book, generally, almost everybody agrees it's the Bible. Even Islam. Cogitate this. Even Islam in the Quran says the people of the book. That's what they call Christians. The people of the book. Now that's a funny thing to me. Alright? So it's, it's universally agreed this is the book. Alright? There's two parts, one thing. The New Testament is veiled in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is unveiled in the New Testament. 
That's what Augustine said about 1,600 years ago. The other way that's phrased is the new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. And so the two of them go together. Without the New Testament, the Old Testament isn't even worth giving time of day to. All right? I say, boy, that's a strong statement. Yeah, it is. Because the prophecies of Daniel 9 are time specific. There has to be a person that fulfilled the prophecies of Messiah within the time window that Jesus and the apostles lived because Daniel said it would be that way. And so if it's not what we call the New Testament, then where is the fulfillment of that prophecy? And if someone wants to say that prophecy has not been fulfilled, which the majority of Jews do, then I have a book that is in a larger collection of books that has been totally invalidated because God can't even get his timing right. And so the New Testament is the completion of everything he started in the Old. It's the foundation for so much. And so the two go together. The two go together. But we'll see if we go on why 90% of the attack is against the New Testament. These are the 66 books. Um, we probably will not get into a discussion of, of canon and deuterocanon. Um, that's, a, that's a whole different conversation. You say, what? Some of you know it as you know, the Protestant Bible and then the Catholic Apocrypha. We won't get into that, okay? That, that's beyond the scope of what we're going to look at in these 13 weeks. That may be another uh, series of lessons later on. But most of us are familiar with the way that the, way that, uh, the New Testament is, is kind of a Bible set up. The first five books are law. The next batch of books is history. The next batch is poetry. Then minor prophets, then major prophets. That's just kind of how they chose to set it up. All right? The ordering of the books, other than the first five in the Old Testament, is purely arbitrary. They're not chronological. They're kind of just topical. Topical kind of chronological. And it doesn't really make a lot of difference. The Gospels have always been at the front. Acts. They put all the stuff that is of Paul's together, and then they put everything else. And that's just how your Bible's put together. All right? Some people know that. Some people don't. So if you already know this, you say, well, I already know this. I won't ask anybody to raise your hand. For those of you that some of this is the first time you're seeing this or hearing this, this is why we go over it. Okay? Um, but that's just how it's laid out. The Old Testament was laid out a little bit different. Obviously, the first five books, the Torah, the Pentateuch, then the prophets. Now, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, all of those are included as prophets. We break them out as history. And then the writings. Now, it's important that the Jews had chronicles at the end. Because you remember when Jesus said, from the blood of Abel to the blood of of Zechariah, the son of Barakai, of Edo, that you slew between the prophets. He says, the whole scripture bears witness to your rebellion. And the reason why is that incident of, of uh, Zechariah, son of Barakai, of Edo, is in Chronicles. And Chronicles was the end. So Jesus was saying, from the front to the back of the Bible, there have been people who have been the enemy of righteous and are willing to shed blood. And he indicted the entire Jewish nation with that statement. That's why they wanted to kill him. Because he said all the blood of everything prior to now of all the righteous is on this generation's head. And so that was why, that's why Jesus said that. Because Chronicles was actually the end of the Old Testament. That was actually the original end. Okay. Chapters and verses. 1,227, the, uh, the year. The Bible's divided into chapters. Okay? Verses come about 300 years later. Now, just me, I think I would have gone on ahead and organized verses a little bit quicker than three centuries. Um, but that's just me. Uh, Robert Stephanus, 
goes on ahead and divides it into verses for easier reference. This is why sometimes I'll tell you, read the chapter before, read the chapter after. When you've got three or four verses in the middle of a chapter that make no sense to you, read the chapter before, read the chapter after. Why? So you can catch the flow of the entire thought. Okay? You say, you know, because there's some chapters that the actual thought of the chapter before doesn't end until ten verses into the next chapter. When they broke Matthew and Luke up, they tried to get the chapters to correspond by number, that the major events of each chapter kind of corresponded between the two. That's why Luke will have chapters that are 70 some odd verses long. Because they're like, well, let's just go ahead and make this chapter this long, so the chapter 3 will tie in to chapter 3 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 3, Jesus gets baptized. Luke chapter 3, Jesus gets baptized. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is tempted. Luke chapter 4, Jesus is tempted. So they set that structure up that way. So if you ever wonder why, you say, how come Luke has these ridiculously long chapters? That's why. They tried to hold themes as close as they could on larger chapter sections. Psalms. Now here's your exception to this. Psalms was already divided by alphanumeric structure since it is a collection of psalms. It's kind of like a greatest hits album. All the songs were already there. That's the order that they were put in on the greatest hits album. So, <clears throat> no. Who thinks there were probably more songs of praise than just the ones that made it into the book of Psalms? Okay, for those of us who own multiple song books, how many of you, some of y'all have seen old song books, right? From the 1800s? Sung to the tune of, you know, don't get drunk in the bar or whatever, you know. And that was the notation. They took the, they took the tune of the drinking song from the bar. They put gospel words on it. They didn't have notes. And they just said, sing it to this tune. That's what some of the original song books were. Okay. But a lot of the other songs in your song books, do you like Fanny Crosby? Well, she's a good Methodist lady. <gasps> I mean, if you like Isaac Watts, you say, what? All right. One person knows who Isaac was. <coughs> Isaac is a little kid. He looked at his dad. His dad was a priest in the Church of England. He said, these songs are terrible. I hate going to church. The music's horrible. It's boring. <laughs> and his dad said, then write songs that are worthwhile. So the kids started writing songs. And here we are singing songs of Isaac Watts. Okay. John Wesley and Charles Wesley. They weren't Methodists. They were both Anglican priests. Charles Wesley wrote over 10,000 songs in his lifetime. Over 10,000. About 9,500 of them weren't worth anything. But a few of them have endured. So, Psalms was already, every psalm was already a song, and they were already numbered in the book. All right? Inspiration is a unique Bible doctrine. 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto the good work. The word therefore inspired of God, they have used us, but so it's that God breathed out the Old Testament writings. Specifically, Paul was talking about the Old Testament. Jesus claimed that the law of Moses was every word from the mouth of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word that was in the law, Jesus said that was the words that came from the Father's mouth for mankind's benefit. David, 2 Samuel 23, 2. This is almost at the end of his life now. He says, the Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. From start to finish, this one book, inspiration is always the divine mind and the divine breath is speaking through mouth or hand. It's always, always connected to the source of the Father. 2 Peter 1 and 2 Peter 3, okay? 
Peter said, No prophecy came by the impulse of man, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God, talking about the original prophets. Then he said, Speaking of this as he does in all his letters, are some things in the heart of the which ignorant and unstable people twist their own instruction as they do the other scriptures. Peter claimed in chapter 1 that his writings were just as inspired as the Old Testament, and at the end of his letter, he put Paul's writings in the same category. That's why whenever, if you ever have nothing to do but waste time uh, on some of these horrible books of theology, there's some bad books of theology out there, y'all. And someone say, well, you know, there was the Petrine Church and the Pauline Church. There was no church of Peter and there was no church of Paul. The fact that Peter says what Paul wrote came from the same Holy Spirit as what I'm writing you, and it came from the same Holy Spirit as everyone in the Old Testament, boom. That be that that would be the equivalent of Joe Biden saying, I believe Donald Trump is the greatest president that we've ever had. And then Donald Trump saying, I, I just can't get over what a great job Joe Biden's doing. Would that 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 would lay to rest all kinds of trouble in our country, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. But that's how people tried to build up the separation between Paul and Peter, even in the early church. And the moment Peter said, if you tamper with what Paul wrote, you're tampering with God. And that, I'm sorry, that, I mean, that's the end of the discussion. And why do we look at this? And I'm kind of speeding through this uh, so we can look at the others, because I've got someone's uh, video, because the way that they say it, I like how they say it. Uh, some of you might recognize the person What's at stake in this battle over the scriptures is the entirety of civilization. The entirety of civilization is what's at stake. The general experience. If categories dis 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 dissolve, especially fundamental ones, the culture is dissolving because the culture is a structure of category. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Right. So in, in fact, culture is a structure Culture is a structure of category that we all share. So we see things the same way. Well, that's why we can talk. I mean, not exactly the same way, because then we'd have nothing to talk about. But roughly speaking, we have a bedrock of agreement. Uh, that's the Bible, by the way. So I just walked through the Museum of the Bible in Washington. That was very cool. It's a very cool museum. So the structure. That's what the Bible Yeah, that's what I figured out. I mean, I just figured this out this week. So it was a cool, it was a cool thing to walk through because it's it's chronological. They have one floor which is the history of the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly that. It's really what it is, is the history of the book. Now, in many ways, the first book was the Bible. I mean literally. Because at one point there was only one book. Like as far as our Western culture is concerned, there's one book. And for a while, literally, there was only one book. And that book was the Bible. And then before it was the Bible, it was, a, you know, it was scrolls and it was writings of papyrus. And, but it was, we were starting to aggregate written text together. And it went through all sorts of technological transformations. And then it became books that everybody could buy, the book everybody could buy. And the first one of those was the Bible. And then it became all sorts of books that everybody could buy. But all those books, in some sense, emerged out of that underlying book. And that book itself, the Bible isn't a book, it's a library. It's a collection of books. And so, what I figured out was, partly because I was talking to my brother-in-law, Jim Keller, who's the world's greatest chip designer, and has now designed a chip that's as powerful as the human brain, which is optimized for artificial intelligence learning, by the way. And so, I talked to him about that, and he said, you heard of the internet? I said, yeah, I did. I heard of it. He said, this is way more revolutionary than that. So, in any case, we were talking about meaning in text because we were talking about translation and the problem of understanding text. And Jim said, the meaning of words is coded in the relationship of the words to one another. And the postmodernists make that case that all meaning is derived from the relationship between words. That's wrong because well, what about rage? That's not words. And what about moving your hand? That's not words. So it's wrong, but, but part of it's right because the meaning we derive from the verbal domain is encoded in the relationship between words. So 
So now then you think, well, let's think about the relationship between words. Well, some words are dependent on other words. Some ideas are dependent on other ideas. The more ideas are dependent on a given idea, the more fundamental that idea is. By de that's a definition of fundamental. So now imagine you have an aggregation of texts in a civilization. You say, which are the fundamental texts? And the answer is, the texts upon which most other texts depend. And so you put Shakespeare way in there in English because so many texts are dependent on Shakespeare's literary revelations. And Milton would be in that category, and Dante would be in that category, at least in translation. Fundamental authors, part of the Western canon, not because of the arbitrary dictates of power, but because those texts influenced more other texts. And then you think about that as a hierarchy, okay? With the Bible at its base, which is certainly the case. Now imagine that's the entire corpus of, li of linguistic production, all things considered. Now how do you understand that? Like, literally, how do you understand that? The answer is, you sample it by reading and listening to stories and listening to people talk. You sample that whole domain. You build a low resolution representation of that in your, inside you, and then you listen and see through that. And so it isn't that the Bible is true. It's that the Bible is the precondition for the manifestation of truth, which makes it way more true than just true. It's a whole different kind of truth. And I think this is, I think this is not only literally the case, factually, I think it can't be any other way. It's the only way we can solve the problem of perception. All right. So, and so you, if you caught what he said, the scope of truth that the Bible takes in is far more than just saying the Bible is true. Okay? Because... How many children will memorize Shakespeare or they can't graduate high school? How many will memorize Milton or Dunn or they can't graduate? That this changing of the psyche, this changing of a civilization. If I take John Dunn out, most people who are Metallica fans don't know one of the greatest Metallica songs is the John Dunn poem. Ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. It's a beautiful poem. <clears throat> How many people don't understand that some of the fundamental concepts of the Constitution are found in Milton's Paradise Lost? But what's the basis for all these stories? What's the basis for all that literature? It's the scripture. And so the moment that you make an entire generation or two come up without that broader scope, it makes it easier to attack the scripture, which is the underpinning for everything. So that when you read John 10 and verse 10, where Jesus says, I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. But the thief does not come except for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Some of you are going to say, Brother Brown, you know this, I believe the Bible. You know, I don't need to be at this, these lessons. And I'll say this, some of you are old enough, you're right, you're going to be dead. And your grandkids and your great-grandkids are never going to ask you the question. And you don't need a good answer. But what if? What if? And they said, how can you keep going to that church building? I learned, you know, in the Sky God concept. Don't you want to be able to say, here's why? And it be something more than well, you know, the Bible's the greatest book ever written, and you should just believe it. Now, I was fine with that as a kid. Was anybody else basically fine with that? The Bible's from God. We should follow it. End of discussion. 
Who understands we that world is so far gone now? Now, does it change the truth of the statement? The Bible is from God. You should obey it. Only if the Bible is true, though. And so when we come to this, why inspiration matters? Why? A divine claim must have evidence. It must. Little Johnny, five years old, for those of us who remember the day when he could get a plastic badge and a pistol that would shoot and make explosive sounds, and he could say, stop, you know, stop in the name of the law, I'm Dirty Harry, make my day, punk. Right? And he could shoot you. Right? Because you could get cat guns everywhere. Right? Why didn't you stop for little Johnny? Because as a plastic badge and a cheap coated chrome pistol, you knew he wasn't law enforcement. The claim must have evidence to back up the validity of the claim. A claim must be validated or invalidated. Just because a claim has evidence doesn't necessarily make it valid. Islam has a lot of evidence for its claims. Its claims are not valid, though. That's a whole different class, whole different study. I'll just leave that one where it is. A divine writing. And this goes across the board to all scriptures. Hindus have scriptures. Muslims have scriptures. Buddhists have scriptures. Satanists have scriptures. <clears throat> Satanists have, yeah, Satanic Bible, Anton LaVey. It's an interesting read. It's kind of weird, but, you know, interesting read. See, you can't not read all those things. They have to be internally valid. They have to be consistent within themselves. They can't be contradictory. They have to be consistent within themselves. And they have to be consistent with what the other things are that have gone before. And a divine writing must be externally verifiable. Now where we'll get to this is the question of fulfilled prophecy. Tommy, I see in the future that a man from Union County who works with hogs that wears short sleeve shirts and whose hair has receded will go home tonight. Wow. No. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Right? They'll give me my own show on Fox. Right? That's very different than saying a thousand years beforehand. They shall divide my garments. They shall pierce my hands and my feet. They will gamble for the rest of my clothes while they look upon me. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit different. That's kind of specific. Especially when crucifixion was not a common thing in 1000 BC. Nailing people to trees or to the wall of the city happened very rarely. It wasn't until the Carthaginians that crucifixion became popular and then the Romans took it and they perfected it. Or how about in Isaiah? He shall give his cheeks to them that pluck the beard. The Romans hated hair. They plucked the beard. They plucked all their body hair off. Yeah, women talk about, you know, waxing. Oh no, the Romans were tough. Their men sat there with tweezers or their fingers pulling every hair. That's why it's very rare. And just, if you ever pay attention, when you're looking at Greco statuary or Greco-Roman statuary, Greece versus Roman, a lot of your Greek statuary all have beards. Almost all of your Roman has none. There are a handful of emperors that have any facial hair. The Romans hated it that much. So here's Isaiah. And at that time, Rome wasn't even a village 
on the title. And he prophesied this. So internally and externally valid. Okay? Divine cause. What we're going to consider. The Bible Greek presupposes the existence of a united divine person in intelligence who speaks to the beings that are a union of spirit and flesh and claims a right of rule over their lives. Now this last part, no one would care to argue about the Bible were it not that. Because the Bible as a book presupposes the right to rule your life. And it makes people uncomfortable because it tells them that they're wrong. It's why the Bible has to be destroyed. Because of God that ultimately says there is no good, there is no evil, I'm all of it within myself and you're coming to me regardless. Doesn't matter. Say, so what, what religion teaches that? Hinduism. Mm -hmm. Hinduism teaches that ultimately there is no good, there is no evil, it's all just false perception on this material plane. Everything's going back to God. None of it matters. To which I ask the question, then why should I put on a saffron robe and put mud on my forehead if none of it matters? Well, so you can get out of the cycle of reincarnation. What you tell me is going to end everything anyways, so I'm going to get out of it eventually. But you tell me I'm being punished for bad I did. But then if I do too much good, then I have to do bad in my next life. But then you tell me that God says there's neither good nor evil. Which is it, you crazy people? <laughs> then you say that it has a right to rule over my life. Yet then you say that I have no choice of the life I have. This is why Hinduism is no threat to anybody. Because it doesn't matter. Buddhism. Eventually I can become a god among atheists. If I go high enough up as a Buddhist, I can become like Buddha and become one of the Bodhisattva. Which means I become a divine being. But there is no divine beings because there are no gods in Hinduism. So all of my gods in Hinduism are atheists and when I get to become a god, I'll be an atheist too. <laughs> Kevin, there's a word that comes to my mind. Well, two Latin words. Non sequitur. Right? You know? That right of rule. Here's the other reason, though, that the Bible has to come down. That right of rule says it only comes through one person, and that's Jesus Christ. And anyone and anything outside of that has no hope. This is the other reason it has to come down. Even without a devil, mankind will rebel against that. Because man wants to be his own highest power. The prophetic witness. The agents who wrote for the divine cause, proclaiming application and judgment, covenant verses and foreigners, and foretelling future events, often without prophets understanding. For me, and this is just for me. The most important book in the whole Bible is the book of Daniel. If the book of Daniel falls, everything else in the Bible to me is absolutely pointless. So, no. The prophecies in Daniel are so specific. Yes. They are so insanely specific. Yes. You can sit down with a book of world history and Daniel chapter 11, and you know which daughter kept loyalty to her dad against his enemies, and which daughter betrayed her dad and caused more chaos in the family. It's all laid out. You know which one? I mean, the, the battle between the, Ptolemy, the, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. All right, how many, of you real, how many of you know Cleopatra of Egypt was as white as anybody? So no, she wasn't. Yeah, she was a Ptolemy. Told of you, told of me, told of them. Right? Alexander the Great had four generals, two of which were super insanely powerful. One was Ptolemy, one was Seleucid. The Ptolemies took the southern part 
i.e. North Africa. The Seleucids took what we would call Turkey in that region, and they went back and forth through Israel fighting with each other for a couple hundred years. Daniel 11 is all of those battles between those people that rose up after Alexander. Just the fact of how it describes Alexander, that a ram will go, his horn be broke, four other horns will be powerful, but they're not as powerful as the one. And then a fourth beast comes, a beast of iron that devours the other beasts in front of it. And that was Rome. That was Rome. And, and just everything in Daniel, the, the 70 weeks of Daniel, you know within two years' time when Messiah has to be crucified. Daniel's prophecy is so specific, you can pinpoint just prophetically, there's only a two-year window, right or left, in which Jesus, in which in which the Messiah could have been crucified. The destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 is in the book of Daniel. It's all there. And because Daniel spoke in the name of Jehovah, if Daniel's prophecies fell, then so does everything else that ties to Jehovah, and everything about Messiah can't be backed up. And you know what Daniel understood? He understood nothing of any revelation he had until after he prayed and said, please help me understand this, Lord. And the Lord gave him a bunch of explanation. And then finally, on the last set of visions that Daniel had, Daniel said, please explain this one. The Lord said, nope, seal it up. And so Daniel finishes out his book, and he has no clue what any of the last huge chunk, basically a third of the book, means. Because the Lord wouldn't give him an explanation. Consider that Moses, Moses, in the year 1500, wrote the prophecy of Balaam. Now think about that. Moses, who led the children of Israel, who was trying to be sabotaged by the prophet Balaam, that Balaam spoke a prophecy about the Messiah and the ships of Kittim that would come. 1,500 years before Rome. That prophetic witness, it's a big deal. People don't want to talk about uh, fulfilled prophecy. How many prophecies would I need to show you for you to realize this ain't just an ordinary book? If I show you 10 that are all a 1,000 years old, before they happened, and that all ten of them came from different languages, different cultures, different economic stations. <clears throat> That's another amazing thing in this prophetic witness. Moses, Moses was a castaway, raised as a king, lived as a shepherd, and then led a bunch of hard-headed, stiff-necked people for 40 years and went back and forth between wanting to kill everyone and asking God to not kill them. <laughs> David, shepherd boy, no one in his family thought twice about it. You ever wonder why David was so excited when he heard what the reward was for killing Goliath? How many other brothers did David have? Seven. Seven. You remember the TV show Eight is Enough? Yeah. Not in ancient Israel. Because if you were number eight, you know what you hoped you got? That the oldest brother might let you carry pots in his house. Because you didn't get nothing. Son number eight, there's no inheritance left for him. So when they said, when David says, hey, what's a guy get for killing this guy? The whole army did. Hey, I got nothing to lose, man. I'm out in the field. Don't nobody care about me. What do they get? They say, you get the girl. All right, I get the girl. Your dad gets to live tax-free. All right. What else? And they give him a couple other things. And then he goes, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? <laughs> now he's ready to fight. How much stuff did David understand? 
because it's not going to come to pass for another thousand years. And it all agrees with everything Moses said. Moses was still alive, Deuteronomy 18. Moses is still alive, and he says that the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet from among your brethren. Peter will quote that prophecy in Acts 3. Moses prophesied about one who would come whose word they had to obey more than they obeyed the word of Moses. 1,500 years, Peter quotes in Acts chapter 3. He said this was Jesus, the word of Jesus more powerful. Hebrews references it in Hebrews chapter 10. So you start looking at that coherence. Start looking at that coherence. And with these guys, these guys didn't know what they were writing. I mean, Isaiah, he calls a guy by name a hundred years before the guy's born. When they're all still in the land and the northern and the southern kingdoms are both still intact. And he calls by name the guy of Persia that will restore them to the land and rebuild, start the rebuilding of the temple. Isaiah didn't have a clue what he was writing. Can you imagine in the year, uh, let's see, what, are we, what year are we in now? 2022, 2020, 2016, 2008. Can you imagine in 1908 if someone would have written a newspaper article and said, uh, the 44th president of the United States will be Barack Obama, and he shall be descended from slaves. And puts that in a newspaper article in 1908. What would you think? Crazy. In 1908, everybody says you're out your mind. And you know what? Why would, what would be the first reason they would have said you were out of your mind? Because in 1908, nobody thought anybody who wasn't white would ever be president. Number one. Then number two, he has a name that sounds like Arabs. Not the standard English names, right? Bob Smith. And we haven't ever had a Bob Smith either. If I had to wager money, I'd go with Bob Smith. But Isaiah had that kind of accuracy in his prophecy. And then so. So this, this witness of the prophetic agents. Why? What's so important? The right of the writings to order and command the lives of covenant people and to get evicted all people of sin and establish terms of surrender and obligation by treaty with the divine authority. Does it have the right to command that? Now we look, we look at about seven scriptures specifically tonight. So don't, don't leave it alone. We didn't have any Bible. We did. We'll go back and watch the tape. Here's where it concludes. There's only two conclusions from what we're going to study over these next 13 weeks. Any entity, whether human, legal, or divine, that would claim such rights, or any document that supports such and expects obedience, must furnish proof of validity to make such a claim. If the Bible is false, then the God of the Bible is a liar and not worthy of worship, obedience, or propagation. If the, Bible, if the Bible does not hold true, period, then there's no point in wasting our time on any of it, because none of it matters. However, if the Bible is true and can be internally, externally, to all the validation we talked about, then it, and, and then the God it presupposes is the one true and holy Lord of all there is, was, and ever shall be. And all humanity must swear eternal loyalty by unconditional surrender and accept the terms of the peace treaty covenant or be damned for rebellion and high treason. When we talk about the validity of the Bible, this is what's at stake. Lots of comments and questions before they come in. I know this old hat to you, Chris, you have this at Bear Valley. So, 
chime in, my brother. Chime in. The rest of them are. Yeah. Did they lay it out that explicit in Christian evidences? Um, there was a lot. It was drinking water through a fire hose. Okay. So. In the big book, number 222, be a song of encouragement, 222. 222, in the big book. Sister Judy Dukes in prayer. She went, started today. She'll be in there for three weeks getting her treatments. Uh, basically kind of isolation uh, for the next three weeks. So she will have a phone. She can't get texts and stuff. Um, and uh, we'll see about getting an address uh, for those that want to be able to send cards. And uh, if, if we get something as far as, you know, if visitation is allowed through a screen or something, we'll let you know that as that comes up. Um, Brother Mark passed on a message from Brother Donald Jackson, uh, said, uh, asked if we would place Pat Pierce on our prayer list, says she'd been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, so uh, please keep Pat Pierce in prayer. Uh, a family friend of uh, Sandra's, uh, Maria, say the last name for me. It's guy. Uh, she passed away from cancer, and so uh, Sister Sandra would ask that we would keep that family in prayer. What are the prayer concerns that we have that we want to be mindful of the time? Mike Roberts, which is Wayne's brother, will will have a pacemaker installed on Friday. Okay. Jackson. Okay. Johnny Webb is still in the hospital. Johnny Webb. Okay. And Betty, we've been checking up on them. There's Betty may be a little better, but it's not a good situation. So he won't ask you to keep Brother Ronnie in prayer. Uh -huh. All right, some different fatigue and some heart and some other issues is getting checked out, and some other appointments he's got coming up. So keep Brother Ronnie in prayer. Yes, ma'am. Gracie Crawford, okay. All right. Uh, girl in Emmy's class, Emmy's grade, uh, having some kidney issues, is in the hospital. So please keep that in prayer. What else do we have? David, what you got? My, my dad has a sore flow. Okay. But he's getting ready to get sick. Okay. No? That works, bud. That works. So we'll pray for the health of your dad, Jimmy. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Jimmy, Jimmy Pickett. 
I know who do. <laughs> That's why I said his name, Jimmy. All right. What else do we have? All right. The, uh, see, I need you to see that this is a spiritual battle that underlays every other spiritual battle. That when the heads of various denominations will undermine the very text that they use in worship in their denominations. And they'll say, well, that was just that time. It doesn't apply to us now. And our own brethren did that, too, on doctrines where they didn't want to fight with someone in their family. They said, well, that was just cultural. And it led to this malaise where we pick and choose what we do and we don't like about the Bible. Until now there's a generation that doesn't even know the basics about God because the previous generation played games with it. So when you ask, how can the president do blank? I want to remind you, don't just ask about this president that's in now. Ask about the last one. And ask about the one before that, and the one before that, and the one before that, and the one before that. And the one before that. Let's see. I'll, I'll go back to probably Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, I think he was pretty much a straight guy. Say, but you're a Ronald Reagan fan. Uh-huh. And his wife was a practicing spiritist. Practice witchcraft. Okay. It's spiritual. So pray. Pray. Corporations, politicians, pray. Universities. Places that train preachers that are supposed to go forward and preach the gospel. Pray. In all human history, there is one name that makes everybody either mad or glad. And the people who say they don't care, you know, it's a funny thing, I mean, all the people that say, I don't care about Jesus, the moment I tell them, well, unless you accept that Jesus is the Lord of the universe and you're baptized into his death, his burial, and his resurrection, you have no eternal life and you're under eternal condemnation, you know what, all of a sudden, they care. Because they get mad and they say, don't you tell me that. Get away. Jesus, the only name, makes everybody either mad or glad. The only name. The only thing that makes everybody else mad is drawing cartoons of Muhammad, okay? <laughs> that only makes a billion people. So as we sing 222, if tonight you've been wavering and you need to reaffirm, you need to recommit your allegiance to the sovereign Lord of the universe, the only Lord in all of history that lived like the people that he leads, and came down to live like the people he leads. And now lives ever to make intercession for those same people. If tonight you need to reaffirm that loyalty, that commitment, will you come? While we stand, while we stand, 222. Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about
Together the next point in time. Just let me pray. Amen. 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 